Coming up on Chasing the Natty, we recap a wild start to the college football season. We give you all the analysis of all the best games from this past weekend, and we give you at least five to six different players at every position that you should be targeting on the waiver wire. All this with special guest, Mr. Justin Heisey from Insider CFF. Coming up right after this. Goes to the end zone. Oh, what a catch! Devontae Smith, touchdown Alabama! Watch out for Mr. Robinson. This kid is going to be special and is already flashing. This is Chasing the Natty, a college football fantasy podcast. All right, welcome in everybody. As I said with the preview, we have a very special guest with us tonight, Mr. Justin Heisey over from CFF Insiders. Uh, Xavier unfortunately could not be with us tonight. He had some stuff come up at the last minute and Mr. Uh, Heisey was able to hop in here and help us discuss all the crazy stuff that happened from week one. It was a wild, wild first week of college football. And yeah, we got a lot to discuss, but Justin, how are you doing tonight, man? Uh, I'm doing well. I don't know if anybody can tell uh, just on the camera, but I am about half a foot shorter than Xavier. Uh, <laughs> if that is an issue for you, I'm sorry. Uh, and before we get into it, I wanted to say specifically to Jared that I could not have been, I could not be more honored to be on such a uh, amazing uh, podcast. Could not be uh, more honored to be such with such a great college football mind that is uh jared that i am with tonight so um uh believe it or not i lost a bet to jared over this game <laughs> this weekend so i had to say something incredibly positive about jared in return i'm probably uh, so gonna something later in the week are you are you are you telling me that you didn't mean a word of that is that what i'm hearing right now <laughs> but we'll say that we'll say that i said it with like 60 percent sincerity all right 60 percent. i'll take 60 yeah. percent. that 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 works for me so we'll go over the show for you guys tonight. As I kind of said at the preview first, we're just going to go through a lot of the big games, a lot of the big storylines from this past week, give you just a full recap of everything that happened. Afterwards, we're then going to go through the way, um, what, who I'm calling the waiver wire winners for this week. So the people you should be targeting at every position. we got about five, six players uh, that we'll run through real quick at each position, talk about why we think that they are valuable in the season going forward. And... Uh, and then we'll wrap up the show with a few uh, few airing of grievances of uh, some of the players that disappointed us the most this past week. So uh, we'll get started with our first game here and nowhere else to start with the biggest game of the weekend. And that is uh, Georgia versus Clemson. And uh, I just have one thing real quick to say to that. Go dogs! All right, moving on to the next game. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, so yeah, this was this was probably the biggest game of the weekend. And Justin, I'll go ahead and let you start giving your thoughts about this game. So what do you think, man? Uh, it's undoubtedly the biggest game of the weekend. I I don't think that I expected it to go like not even with the necessarily outcome of it, but the fact that it was so low scoring. Um, usually with these types of games, where you, if you get a um, if you get a matchup between two of the top four programs in the country, it usually hits the over. Um, and so it was very unusual to see a combined total of six offensive points mm -hmm. uh, at the end of that one. But uh, uh, on the Clemson side of things, there's very clearly a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I think there was issues with the rookie quarterback issues with the play calling i'm sure they'll get it figured out and odds are this won't be the last time we see clemson georgia play this year so um that's pretty well all i have on it uh joe nagata was had the game of his life out there uh, it was nice to see that he can actually uh grasp a football with both of his <laughs> hands and bring it down without dropping it um, cause he did that a lot the first two years, but, uh, it seems that he's a favorite of DJU. Um, and if he wasn't already so highly owned, I would have him in my waiver pieces as well. Uh, but he has a pretty sizable, uh, share of ownership anyway. 
Yeah, uh, regarding Engada, I definitely can say that Xavier and I, a uh, little spoiler for uh, King's Classic video for this week, but uh, we definitely have already kind of talked about maybe picking him up because, again, like you said, even in this loss where Clemson's offense was stifled pretty much the entire game, Joseph Engada, who I was honestly shocked was playing. I was hearing that he was um, injured. Uh, there were some rumors that maybe he was falling down the depth chart just a little bit, but he came out there. He, like you said, he had the game of his life. So uh, I'd absolutely, if you're really struggling at receiver and for some reason Joseph's on the waiver wire, absolutely worth a pickup. We'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, as far as my thoughts on the game and everything, I, just like you and most everybody else, was kind of shocked at how low the score was at the end of the day. But also when you really thought about it afterwards and it made all the sense in the world, these were two young offensive lines going up against two of the best defensive lines in the country. These were offenses that were not going to have a lot of time in order to develop plays, especially long passing plays. So they needed to get their balls out quick. They were gonna be making short passes, run runs all night long. These were not defenses that were going to be giving up big plays all over the place. So again, even still with all of that, probably lower scoring than I think a lot of people wanted to see. But regardless, that's what happens when you get two massive teams like this uh, come up against each other. It's gonna be strength on strength. And this is what you get. So I guess we'll go ahead and move on to the next game here, and that is LSU uh, taking the L on the road to UCLA. I will admit, I knew this game was going to be a relatively close one. Like a lot of people were shocked when the Vegas number came out and LSU was only favored by three. Um, I knew that Chip Kelly was building something in UCLA. Um, I, I figured that it was going to be hitting at one point or another. I did not expect this though. I did not expect to see UCLA basically almost have this game in hand for the majority of it, except for maybe the first quarter. That was the only time I was like, okay, LSU can probably still win this thing. But like second quarter on, especially when UCLA got their run game going and LSU couldn't for the life of them, that's when I said, UCLA is very likely to win this game, especially if LSU is continuing to have to rely on the pass. So what are your thoughts, Justin? Uh, yeah, it was it was a shocking outcome for for sure. I thought that they might keep it close. It kind of validates um, their week zero performance a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. uh, after week after week zero, it's like okay, we'll see how good UCLA actually is this week because uh, uh, Hawaii has the tendency of being really good at times and really terrible at times. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was kind of this week was kind of a more of a, a validation. It's like hey this team is actually pretty good because regardless of how bad LSU's defense might be, because it was pretty bad last year, uh, their offense is still pretty good. Max Johnson had the single greatest incomplete pass I've ever seen thrown <laughs> as he ran away and chucked the ball backward. Briefly forgot he was a left-handed quarterback when I went and watched the replay of it. Um, <laughs> so absolutely shut the run game down once again for a second week in a row. That UCLA run defense is really, really good. Um, I'd say uh, if you're a betting person, uh, you might want to hop on and see if you can get into some, some UCLA Pac-12 champion uh, type bets in before they start working their way up to the top. Um, but this this Chip Kelly team is something special. They got a good duo of backs, and Dorian Thompson Robinson's playing really, really well uh, with Greg Dulkich out there catching passes. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And again, that's that's the part that I am really kind of fascinated with is just this running game that UCLA has developed this year. Like you think Chip Kelly, you think kind of explosive, high tempo offense, but really it's these two running backs and Zach Charbonnet as kind of the more elusive back and then Britton Brown, who's that bully that'll get you three, four yards exactly whenever you need it. And it's quite a duo. And again, like I, Xavier made fun of me for it after their Hawaii thing, but I made the prediction. I was like, this could be this year's Michael Meyer and Javante Williams kind of duo in the backfield. Like maybe not that high, but if, if, if all things go right, I do think that's their ceiling. And if that is the case, UCLA could, like you said, be very well on its way to an appearance in the Pac-12 championship. And if Oregon keeps playing the way it is, maybe UCLA is Pac-12 champions this year. That would be a wild twist for this year. So, oh yeah, that UCLA-USC game is going to be real crucial at the end of the year. 
Oh yeah. Um, again, Pac-12 South, that, that, that is going to be a knife fight this year. That, that, that division is going to be fun to watch. Uh, cause I, again, I like Arizona state, uh, Utah, both, uh, they're all, uh, again, you, basically everybody, but Arizona, I think down there has, uh, at least something to say about who wins that division. Um, again, on the LSU side of things, I do think that this shows that there are some glaring problems in this program. Like last year wasn't entirely just a fluke. Um, they got a full off season now. Now, granted, they did lose Miles Brennan, but again, from everything I've heard, Max Johnson was getting plenty of reps with the ones. Um, and to be fair, he was not the reason why they lost that game yesterday. He did everything that he could. The like, like, like again, that amazing pass that you were talking about was probably the only big moment where I was just like, "What are you doing?" But other than that, like he he had a he had a perfectly fine game, like over three hundred yards, three touchdowns, one interception, like. You couldn't ask him to do much more. Again, it was the big problem was I think they what was it like forty something yards for twenty five carries uh, uh, on the ground. Like that. Their, it, their defense is. I, I remember before the year started, so I was kind of on the Brennan train uh, during the off season before he uh, before he inevitably got hurt, um, and uh, I had made the argument. Uh, once or twice, it's, if you go back and look at Brennan's stats over those first four games that he played, it was like through the roof touchdowns and passing yards. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, your quarterback can't play defense. Um, it just seems like that awesome defense they had that took them to the national championship, uh, along with Joe Burrow is just completely gone. Uh, and now you're left with like a solid linebacker and a good safety. Well, they got, they, and outside they, of that, it's just a bunch of guys. I was say they got Derek Singley still from that championship game. But I think that's literally the only per, the only starter they have left from that championship defense they had in 2019, along with that offense. And it looks like they've been able to replace the offense pretty decently, uh, at least um, kind of some of the major keys. But again, that defense really is kind of struggling. And they got rid of Bo Pelini, which is a good move on my part. But it sounds it's looking like more and more this is just a program. Um, problem within when it comes to this defense so we'll go ahead and move on to uh we're not doing these in alphabetical or, or alphabetical my god we're not doing doing these like in timeline order so please forgive me if i'm jumping around the schedule here these are mostly just as i as i thought about this past weekend the more interesting games that we had uh so we're gonna go back to thursday night and this was a ucf and their comeback against boise state uh Justin, what are your thoughts on this game uh, it definitely shocked me. Uh, I think I have a few different Central Florida whatever accounts that follow me, and I followed them back. Um, and one popped up, and it said that Josh Heupel never would have won that game. And I mm -hmm. never have, and I don't think I've ever seen a more accurate statement than that. Um, it was never a big Heupel fan. Didn't think his teams were all that disciplined. Um, Gus Malzahn's kind of come in there. Uh, and led them to a huge comeback win. I, 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 at the end of that game, I was like, there's no way that you that Central Florida should have ever won this game. Boise mm -hmm. State doesn't lose games when they get up like this. Uh, it was an excellent comeback on their part. Isaiah Bowser is a freaking dude. Um, and on top of that, it looks like we've got some halfway decent receivers that we can pick from in a Malzahn offense. So, uh not nothing but positives on the Central Florida side. Uh, I personally, for one of my dynasty leagues, needs uh, need George Halani to get healthy <laughs> so that I can play him and him actually accumulate points because I did the opposite of that this week where I played him and he did not. So um, need that guy back. But uh, Bachmeyer looks solid. Khalil Shakir is the man. Oh, clear. It appears that Isaiah Bowser awesome. is as well. Yeah, no. Again, like you said, um, I I I saw a tweet the other day, or the other day, like after that game happened, where they said like this is the reason why Gus was brought to UCF to be able to make these halftime adjustments. And I think that was the story of this game. Uh, you had a young coach, um, first time head coach. Um, I, I forget his name off the top of my head, but at Boise It'd be State, Arroyo, right? Marcus Arroyo. No, no, it's uh, it starts with an A. Hold on, let me look this up. Um, but anyway, he's a first year head coach at Boise State, inheriting a great program. Don't get me wrong, but even still, you saw the experience, I think, last night when Gus Malzahn made his adjustments on defense, made his adjustments on offense for the second half. And this Boise State head coach, who I can't, what is his name? Andy Avalos. 
Um, ah, that's right. Andy Avalos was not able to make those changes. Like, because Gus made the changes at halftime, and Avalos was not ma- able to make the changes during the third and fourth quarters. And I think that's what ultimately ended up dooming him and Boise State in this game. But regardless, this was an incredible game. Like, um, even until the last minute, Boise State was fighting. The, like, it's not like they got completely blown out in the second half. Um, but again, they're again. This was just a fun college game where all the star players got to shine. You got to see Khalil Shakir. You got to see Dylan Gabriel. You got to see um, Jalen Johnson go off. Isaiah Bowser was probably one of the best surprises of the weekend in terms of that RB room at UCF actually being condensed to one guy was great to see. But again, we'll kind of get to that a little bit later. You have any more thoughts on this before we move on to our next game, Justin? Uh, I think I'm okay. Sounds good. So again, we'll stick to Thursday night and we're going to be looking at uh, the Ohio State versus Minnesota game. And I think the big story here was CJ Stroud uh, struggling first half, coming back in the second half and throwing four touchdowns, uh, kind of proving like that he can he can uh, take over where Justin Fields left off. And of course, the other major story here is unfortunately Muhammad Ibrahim, the star running back for Minnesota likely out for the rest of the season with a torn Achilles. So Justin, what are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, that's Ibrahim's the biggest one. Um, It really seemed like, it really seemed like Minnesota might get the job done until Ibrahim went down. Uh, He went down and then the strip sack uh, that led to six really hurt him as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Stroud looked really good in the second half. Uh, He came out, they set things up for him to succeed and uh, he did all he could and uh, went away with, you say four touchdowns. I believe it was four touchdowns by the end of the night. Yeah. And so um, it is, you know, when you, especially for so many people that have invested into CJ Stroud, uh, considering he was one of the top 10 quarterbacks off of most uh, fantasy boards uh, and most drafts that I've seen anyway, um, it's nice to see that he can come through and produce like we've seen Ohio State quarterbacks in the past do. Uh, because that starting quarterback at Ohio State. Uh, we know for two things, they're going to score a lot and they're not going to get pulled until late in the fourth quarter because then they keep them dudes in long past time to pull them. Absolutely uh, agree. And so it's, it's nice to see Stroud do well. Uh, Trey Henderson had that ridiculous uh, touchdown reception. I think it went for 70. It was 60 or 70 yards. It was 70. Um, so it was – it was good to see him produce like he did. Mayan Williams did really well as well. Um, and it looks like we're all going to be hitting up uh, Trace and Potts. Uh, I would say every, everybody wants that. Everybody wants Potts. Yeah, if nothing else, we know that he's going to get like 30 carries a game. He might not do anything with them, but he's going to get the touches, and that's what matters most. Hey, man, if you're carrying three yards a carry for 30 games, that's at least 90 yards. And you can, if you can get a touchdown in there, that's, a, that's just a floor starter every single week right there. Oh, absolutely. Um, in addition, I want to point out that I, I looked, I wanted to look this up before I said anything, but of those four touchdowns that CJ Stroud threw, the shortest one was 38 yards. Like that, like this is going to be a team. This is a going to be, this is an Ohio state team that is like, this is an Ohio state team that'll trade points with anybody in the country. And they have the offense to do it. This is a team that can easily, if they can get their defense figured out just a little bit is a championship caliber team. It's a team oh, that can score on any given play. And this is a team that I think teams like Clemson and Georgia should absolutely be fearing, especially if they don't get their offensive woes figured out. Because as good as those defenses are, at Georgia, at Clemson, even Alabama, Ohio State is going to break open for, for long touchdowns in your games. That's part of the reason why you want to own C.J. Stroud. That's why you want to own Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, all these got all these receivers at Ohio State because you know that when they score a touchdown, they are absolutely going for at least 20, 30 yards. So, again, that was just something I want to point out there. And it was, again, this is just stuff I was very just glad to see. Um, I think a lot of people are... One thing I did want to kind of pump the brakes on a little bit was Travion Henderson just a little bit. Um, I, again, don't get me wrong, by far the most talented back we've seen in a very, very long time, but his entire production came on one play 
And yeah. I don't think people need to start jumping over to the waiver wire. Expect or if he is on the waiver wire for some reason in your league. Um, I don't think people need to jump over there trying to trade for him or anything like that, expecting him to break off for a 70-yard touchdown every single game. I don't think that's sustainable. I definitely don't think that's where he is at yet. Now, by the end of the season, who knows? Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next game here, uh, and that's Oklahoma surviving to Lane. So, Justin, what are your thoughts here? Uh, that game was... That was it's just an insane game. You know, when you go through the uh, you go through schedules when you're evaluating players, you're doing your player rankings. Um, I loved Michael Pratt last year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was a guy that was going to it's like, I'm going to play Michael Pratt and he's going to somehow manage to get three touchdowns. I don't know if it's going to be passing or rushing or whatever, but he's going to get three touchdowns. Uh, there's just some players that are like that. Uh, and he was that guy as a freshman. I uh, looked at a schedule this year and. Uh, you know, starting off the year against Oklahoma, Oklahoma was supposed to have this vastly improved defense because they returned so many guys. Um, and to go out there and to barely get by Tulane makes mm -hmm. them look a lot more beatable than they should be. Um, you know, they're going to get a lot of they're going to get a lot of points, but it seems like that Oklahoma defense is still just that the Oklahoma defense. Um, Kennedy Brooks outproducing Eric Gray uh, kind of came as a shock. Um, I believe, you know, Eric Gray was going off, going off boards way early. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I had him set as like a top 15, 20 running back, uh, which, uh, a good buddy of ours, Nate Marquise as, as a big Oklahoma guy himself, he still, he still believes in Eric Gray. And this was just a situational thing that Brooks just had the hot hand, but I guess we'll see how it goes. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Pratt's a dude. I don't know that oh, yeah. I'm worried about any other defense for the rest of the season outside of Cincinnati. I think he's going to be just fine no matter who he plays. Yeah, no, I'm actually going to defend Oklahoma here a little bit. Um, I'm going to defend specifically the Oklahoma defense because I do believe that they are improved. Just based on what I – like. Um, I, I think it was Josh paid in his segment when he was kind of talking about it, where he, he said that like, this is one of those moments where if you look at the box score, yeah, you immediately look at that and be like, Oh my God, Oklahoma's defense. What are we doing? Versus what's going on with the eye test. I test. I watched Oklahoma's defense. They looked much improved from previous years. The problem was Spencer Rattler turning the ball over in unfortunate situations and putting that defense in very unfortunate situations where they had to defend a short yard drive. Like this is going to be something where I think this is not going to be the stats you're going to be seeing against Oklahoma in every single game. I think they learned a lot of lessons from this game. And I do think that it's a little premature just to say that, oh my God, this is the same Oklahoma defense. But also maybe it's a little premature to say that, you know, this defense is much improved. I think it's one of those we have to wait and see. Um, I think there is some things going against them yesterday, some things going for them yesterday. We will see at the end of the day, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. Michael Pratt is a dude, and there's no reason why he should be on the waiver wire after this week in any league. Um, if he can, if he can, not. if he can do this against Oklahoma, one of the top teams in the country, you can bet that he will be doing it against every. They're AAC, correct? I'm yeah. a, I, I, for some reason, some belt came to mind, but no, AAC. They'll be able to do it against the defensively challenged AAC. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next game because we're running a little over time for this segment, but that's okay. Um, Notre Dame versus Florida State. This is the game last night. Um, I can't think of almost a better game this past weekend. There are a lot of great games, but this was kind of the one I think took the cake, mostly because of just the storyline of Mackenzie Milton coming back in, almost leading a comeback for Notre Dame. And I can't even think of a fan base that was more happy after a loss than Florida State Seminoles were. I mean, obviously, they were probably a little dejected that they lost at the end of the night. But even still, they hung with a top 10 team. Mackenzie Milton comes back in, looks great, um, almost leads a comeback. Any thoughts here, Justin? Uh, it's just like, uh, you know, me and you were talking before we started. Um, I kind of, you know, Norvell's getting a lot of flack for starting Jordan Travis. Their mm -hmm. offensive line may be, like, slightly better than it has been if it is. And so I can understand starting the dude that can run like Travis can, but you know, McKenzie Milton came in the stadium erupted. Um, and it really seemed like they, he just gave that offense a spark that it needed at the right time, mm -hmm. uh, led two scoring drives. 
uh jay sean corbin was amazing oh yeah um it just seemed like you know they kept lining him up at wildcat quarterback they'd hand the ball off to him and it seemed like every time he got the ball even with how bad that line was he managed to get six or seven yards every rush um i I watched the game with my dad my dad kept making the joke that his uh rushing average just kept getting worse because he started off the game with a you know like (laughs) an 86 yard touchdown run um but uh he looked really really good uh the whole way through and so if for some reason corbin's available in your leagues go get him i know Mm -hmm. he's got a higher percentage ownership but he looks really good i kind of expect milton to take the starting snaps next week uh just based on the way that he came in and despite poor offensive line play looked um mainly because you know he just he looked really good he even ran really good when he took off running uh the only thing else i have to say about this is i never thought i'd see the day where jack cone threw for that many oh my god you're right and i never thought that i would ever see a safety book at 20 yards across field to make a diving interception out of bounds that was the most insane pick i've ever seen yeah pretty like like i said like i can't think of a better game than this was yesterday there's just so many memorable moments from this game if you haven't looked at the highlights from this game or if you can find the full game just sit down and watch this game. This is going to be a game we point at to at the end of the season and say, yeah, that was one of the better games of the entire season. Um, again, like I said, just the storyline surrounding it. Um, you never, I don't think I've ever seen a stadium full of people truly. And like, obviously like stadiums full of fans will embrace like their quarterback and everything. But there was just something special when Mackenzie Milton went out there after Travis got his helmet knocked off. And you just felt the entire, you like, you you didn't feel support when he went out there. You felt love in that stadium. You just felt it, that there was an felt entire. Like you were watching your own quarterback play. You're right. One hundred. That, you, that's a, that's a great way to say that. That's exactly how I felt when I watched it. Because there was nobody I was rooting for more last night than Mackenzie Milton. I was waiting. I was God. I I wanted him to get that final touchdown, but unfortunately, reality sets in. Unfortunately, things just don't always have a storybook ending. But regardless, I'm actually going to defend real quick before we move on here. I'm going to defend Mike Norvell because a lot of people are giving him flack today about uh, icing his own kicker. And it's really easy to say that when you're not the one on the sideline. But the thing is, imagine you're Mike Norvell. You are a head coach of a program that has had kicking problems in the past. You have a kick. You have a freshman kicker coming in this year. So you are you are already just adding a disadvantage at that at that position. Milton takes a bad or a bad snap flies to Milton. They're knocked back like 10, almost 15 yards to the point where it's not like a 50 something yard field goal to stay in this game. If you're the head coach of a program and you see something that ke- that allows your freshman kicker to get about 15 yards closer to a field goal, why would you not take that? Why would you not take the time to call a time out there and make sure that they get that right or challenge that to make sure that they get that right? It just happens that after he made that call, the kicker made the 50-yard field goal and then proceeded to miss the 35-yard. There was nothing Mike Norvell could have done about that. He had already made that call well before that kick was underway. So I'm going to defend him there. What I won't defend him for is going for it on fourth and like five at his own 30 in the middle of the third quarter. That was a weird decision. I don't think anybody can really defend that. It was a bad call. So we'll go ahead and move on from there. Uh, the other defensive battle of the weekend was Penn State versus Wis- at Wisconsin. Uh, not really a ton to say here, in my opinion. The main thing I wanted to point out was I do think Ches Malusi is likely the RB1 at Wisconsin going forward. And we saw this on the depth chart today that they released um, where Jalen Berger was joined by, I forget his uh, I forget the other running back's name, but he was joined by another running back at the RB2 position. So it's not that I think Berger is necessarily falling down the depth chart, but I think Wisconsin is just very comfortable with handing off the ball 20, 25 times a game to Ches Malusi. He kind of proved that yesterday. He gave he gave that game all he could. I think he rushed for over 100 yards, got a touchdown. Uh, he did very, very well. He was not the reason why Wisconsin lost that game. You can point to Graham Mertz for that one. Um, on the Penn State side of things, sometimes you just have to make enough plays. Uh, they by every metric of the box score except for the scoreboard they should have lost that game yesterday but sometimes when you just make one play with Jahan Dodson or Parker Washington or you have one running back break off for just enough yards to keep yourself in this game or when you block a field goal that's all you need to win a game and Penn State 
hats off to them for just sticking in with this game and winning at the end of the day. Absolutely. When it comes to, you know, I'm looking at Penn State's box score right now, and there's like lots of questions that come to my mind. Like, why is Sean Clifford throwing 30 plus passes? Mm -hmm. Why is Noah Kane getting less than 10 carries? Why is Sean Clifford getting less than 10 carries? But at the end of the day, you know, Graham Mertz tosses a pair of picks. Um, and that's what ends up killing them. And, uh, you know, just like you said, it's just a matter of who made more plays. Penn State made more plays. So, again, that, that, and that's another game. If you haven't watched the replay or haven't watched the highlights for that game, go watch it. Like, that, that truly was a game of a good defensive battle and then things just kind of broke open in the second half. And it was very nice to watch. Like I said, it's always fun when you have these kind of games where you just have to see who makes more plays at the end of the day. And Penn State was the, the team for that. Uh, last game I think we're going to cover here real quickly is uh, Oregon surviving Fresno State. This was one that I was honestly benching almost all my Fresno State players unless I really needed to because I was like, okay, Oregon's one of the top teams in America. Like Fresno State, they, their defense with Kayvon. Well, they lost Kayvon Thibodeau, unfortunately. It was Actually, I'm having a brain fart. Did they lose in this game or did they lose in the week before? No, they lost in this game. They lost yeah. in this game. Okay. They went down early. Um, so that, that that's probably a good reason why Fresno State was able to hang in this game as much as they could because they didn't have that threat coming off the edge um, with Jay Kiner. Um, but yeah, Fresno State, I think, uh, proved a lot of doubters wrong about like maybe that offensive uh, struggles at the beginning against UConn. They eventually got going, but a lot of people started worrying like, oh, once they face better competition, are they going to be able to get it going? Clearly, yes, they scored 24 on a very good Oregon defense, in my opinion. And so that to me was kind of the bigger story of this. Uh, Oregon doing just enough out talenting Fresno State to keep the lead and win by a touchdown at the end of the day. Yeah, strong run game from Oregon. Uh, big game there from my one of my favorite players, Jalen Cropper, over at Fresno State. Uh, but just like you said, sometimes sometimes it just comes down to who's more talented Oregon certainly got a lot of talent on that team they've recruited incredibly well uh hit transfer portal pretty well um Anthony Brown has looked good at Oregon mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say he's looked good at Oregon there's certainly some times at Boston College where he did not look good but uh he's looked solid while he's been at Oregon the ground game worked for them really well yesterday as well uh with Verdell and Travis Dye and Anthony Brown all kind of working together and getting close to 200 yards collectively. If I remember correctly, it wasn't there times where all three of them were on the field at the same time? They had Travis Dye, they had Verdell, and they had Brown out there? I wouldn't blame them if they did. I guess, again, uh, that, that's a good collection of backs. It's just all of a sudden, you, like, that defense has three people out there to worry about right then and there. So... But again, hats off to Oregon for surviving that game. So now we're going to move on to our waiver wire winners for this week. Uh, first, we're going to start with quarterbacks. Then we'll hit running backs, wide receivers, and then tight ends. So we got six quarterbacks we want to talk to you guys about today. The first of which we're going to go Mr. Michael Pratt. We already talked about him earlier. Mr. Michael Pratt from Tulane scored 33.24 points this past week in half PPR formats and is currently owned on only 30% of rosters. Every waiver wire winner you will see here today, by the way, is on less than 40% of teams. So, Justin, we kind of already talked about Michael Pratt already, but is there anything else you kind of wanted to say about him? Uh, just that, uh, you know, it's like I said earlier, Michael Pratt's a guy that's going to get you three scores a game. Uh, it, you know, you kind of think back to a few years ago. I think he's better. I think, like, in, as far as fantasy goes, he's better than this guy. But Malik Rozier for Miami uh, a few years ago, and he was a guy that was going to go out there. He's going to throw for two touchdown passes, run for one, and throw one or two picks. And mm -hmm. this is what Michael Pratt's going to do, except he's probably going to throw for something like, three touchdown passes and 300 yards with maybe one or two picks and a rushing touchdown. So he's mm -hmm. now that I know that he can handle Oklahoma. Like I said, there's only one defense in the American that I'm really worried about. And that is Cincinnati over there in Cincinnati. I think I can pick up Pratt and bench him one game and be absolutely fine with that. Uh, not a lot to argue against him after doing what he did this weekend. Yeah, uh, just a just a tough, tough player. Like he took shot after shot in that game, was not giving up the entire time. Like this is just a dude that you want on your team. He's gonna he's gonna be playing a full time every single game. Uh, he'll never he'll never. 
uh, feel the need to uh, get off the field or anything like that after taking a shot. Um, absolutely, draft Michael or draft. Uh, pick up Michael Pratt anywhere you can. Um, if you have a budget league, absolutely throw a good amount of money his way because you know there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be coming after him after his performance this past weekend. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next quarterback, and that is going to be Mr. Chris Reynolds from Charlotte, who upset Duke this weekend. That's kind of one of the games I, for some reason, didn't put on our list of games to talk about. But Charlotte upsetting their first uh, Power 5 program in school history. Congratulations to them. Uh, Chris Reynolds this past weekend scored 34.66 points in his own currently on 20% of rosters. Uh, I think Chris Reynolds is one of those guys that, I think, if I remember correctly, a lot of people were high on him last year. And people were drafting him pretty high, and he did not do very well last year uh, compared to expectations. So I think a lot of people were a little burned and thus not willing to pick him up in drafts this year. But maybe th- it looks like maybe this is the year between uh, him, uh, Victor Tucker, and uh, uh, DeBose, who uh, kind of broke out in their game against Duke yesterday. Um, my, uh, Chris Reynolds can maybe has finally found his footing. What do you think, Justin? Uh, you know, last year during the COVID year, uh, when Charlotte played, they didn't look good and they missed a lot of games due to COVID uh, last year. It seemed like you were always hesitant to start a Charlotte player because not even that they wouldn't play good, they just might not even play. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they had a lot of games, for uh, not forfeited, but uh, canceled last season. Uh, he looked really, really good. And that duo of receivers looked really, really good. Um, I've, uh, Eric from NBC sports edge, uh, we kind of talked, he said, man, I wish I would have started Victor Tucker. And I was, I told him, I was like, the only reason he played good is because we all probably had him benched. That's usually <laughs> what he does when you play him. He doesn't do that. And you leave him on the, the bench for a week and he goes off, but this is his, this is his final year. He's already said it's his final year. So maybe this is the, the Victor Tucker year, but you know, Chris Reynolds is a solid player. Uh, they've, I've read article after article about Chris Reynolds and they say that he doesn't necessarily do anything special, but he knows how to run this offense. Um, and he's got some good dudes around him and Will Healy's a heck of a coach. That's probably not going to be in Charlotte for very much longer. It would not surprise me if he was gone after this year or the next year, especially if he keeps it up with this, go ahead and move on to the next player. And we've already, again, we kind of touched on this earlier and that was, uh, Mr. Jack Cohn, uh, from quarterback out of Notre Dame. Uh, throwing and rushing for 30.34 points in fantasy leagues yesterday. He is owned on only 9% of fantasy rosters. This was a complete shock for me. I did not expect a Notre Dame quarterback to be throwing for over 300 yards and three touchdowns in this game. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say. This, this one came out of nowhere for me. Um, the, my only question is, can he keep it up? Is, is this going to be something we're going to be seeing week after week, or is this something that just the moment kind of brought where Florida State was going up and down the field, Notre Dame had to keep up, and Jack Cohn just knew how to throw exactly right to Kevin Austin and some of the other, or Michael Meyer, some of these other uh, great receiving weapons that Notre Dame looks like they might finally be utilizing. What do you think, Justin? Uh, like I said earlier, when I, I never thought I'd see the day where Jack Cohn top 300 with four touchdown passes. Um, it, he's got a little bit of mobility to him, too. So that's just an added plus. Uh, you know, he's not going to take off running like Pratt or Reynolds like we listed before. But, uh, you know, he's going to pick up a handful of yards on the ground. And if he can keep up this pace passing wise to where even if he gets like close to 200 and a couple of touchdowns, that's pretty solid numbers for a guy that I thought uh, – I thought he was coming over to Notre Dame to do the Wisconsin thing that he Mm -hmm. was doing over there because Jack Cohn was really good at catching a snap and turning sideways. I thought that's (laughs) why he went to Notre Dame because you can do that over there too because they got good running backs to Notre Dame. But uh, that was incredibly unexpected by Jack Cohn. Yeah, again, I hope he can keep it up. I hope Notre Dame's one of these programs that kind of turns it around the whole offensive narrative they have going on where like they're one of these teams where they never develop uh offensive talent at least until they get to the nfl level um but again maybe they turn it around this year and jack Cone be a hell of a story if he uh went out here and just lit it up at notre dame so we'll go ahead and move on to our fourth quarterback here i'm gonna have austin kendall quarterback out of louisiana tech transferred in from west virginia um there's another one that kind of surprised me um 
Austin Kendall kind of brought in a element to the Louisiana Tech offense that they didn't really have last year with, um, I forget his name, Luke Anthony, I believe the quarterback was last year, um, so. where they just did not have a passing game whatsoever. Uh, Austin Kendall came in there, lit it up on the scoreboard and uh, behind the backs of uh, Marcus Williams and uh, some of their other running backs they have there. Um, again, clearly had a great game. Uh, went up completely on Mississippi State. Uh, I believe they were ahead by three touchdowns almost like at least three uh three possessions they were ahead by uh, right. it took uh, 21 points from mississippi state for them to come back in the fourth quarter and they only won by or they only lost by one so austin kendall i think is definitely one of the surprises of this weekend i'm not sure if this is going to be a week-to-week um pickup but no reason why if you're struggling at quarterback in one of your leagues you can't just go over there pick up austin kendall hold him onto your bench for a week and just see what the hell happens what are your thoughts here, Justin? Uh, it'd be nice to see a Louisiana Tech quarterback play like we know they they can. We really haven't had really haven't had a good guy at Louisiana Tech at quarterback since Ryan Huggins left. Uh, Jamar Smith was the next guy up, and he had moments where he was pretty good, but he never amounted to what we thought that he would amount to. And then last year they played quarterback carousel. Mm -hmm. the whole season so we just didn't get anything there um you know he threw for under 200 but he had a good game rushing too so maybe we're finally getting uh back to some real positive uh quarterback play at louisiana tech to where we can pick those dudes up maybe we can get a guy that stands out at receiver too like maybe graham or means picks up Mm -hmm. after this week and keeps on going one can definitely only hope and uh kind of along the similar vein we'll go ahead and move on to our fifth quarterback here will levis at at kentucky this was just another one that i think caught people out of nowhere where all of a sudden kentucky was just throwing the ball over the yard granted it's ul monroe so it's not like it's a premier defense or anything like that but even still the fact that kentucky wasn't just sitting there handing it off to chris rodriguez and their stable of running backs behind him the entire game just to drown out the clock and score a few touchdowns and call it a day they were willing to just toss it around play around see what they can do will levis was hitting shot after shot downfield wandale robinson and josh ali both looked incredible in this game and i think they really helped will levis in this regard i would not be shocked if will levis continues this as they keep going i think they're just going to continue uh trying to throw the ball around until somebody stops them yeah that uh they're all their oc loves will levis um from what I've read, you know, it kind of came as a surprise that he had beat out Joey Gatewood. And then after that, it seemed like everything that came out about him was nothing about how their new offensive coordinator just loves Will Levis, his athletic abilities, how big of an arm he has, uh, things like that. And, you know, he came out and you're right, it is UL Monroe, which is not exactly this juggernaut of a defense. But uh, the fact that he came out there and just like, he threw four touchdown passes. Ali and Robinson both had 100 yards receiving and a score. Uh, he looked really, really good. Uh, he made me happy that I had picked him up uh, in the dynasty league that you and I are in oh, God. Uh, pretty early on uh, to where if this kind of sus- – if this sustains, that it's going to be a really good long-term play. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, now, now you got me jealous that you did pick him up in that dynasty league because I'm looking at that waiver wire and I'm trying to find people to pick up and I'm like, there's not a lot of options. It's a very deep league. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to our final quarterback here and I'll kind of let you kind of uh, lead this discussion because this is uh, the one that you wanted me to add on here. Uh, and that's Mr. Hazik Daniels. Uh, I just misspelled his name on the graphic. That's fine. Uh, uh, Hazik Daniels, quarterback out of Air Force. So what, what are your thoughts here, Justin? Uh, When it comes to triple option quarterbacks, um, I like to look for what I call the right type of selfish. Um, And it seemed that with uh, Timothy Jackson stepping out of the picture, that this was supposed to be the Brad Roberts year uh, over at Air Force. Um, I went back and looked uh, after the game and checked the box score. Uh, and I saw that Brad Roberts had accumulated this ridiculous amount of yards. And I was like, all right, I've got him in one or two of these best ball leagues that we got going on. That's pretty, that's pretty great. And then he had one touchdown and they had won by a great deal. And I was like, where did all these touchdowns come from? And then I scroll down and see Hazik Daniels reaching 96 rushing yards and three rushing touchdowns. 
when you're getting a triple option quarterback, you want the dude that's selfish. You want the guy that's like, we're on the goal line and I'm taking the ball. Mm -hmm. Um, And it seems that that's what Hazeek Daniels is doing this year. Um, So if he keeps it up, that's another really good play uh, from kind of an unexpected place. We're more used to seeing this in Army and Navy than we are from Air Force. Um, So Hopefully he keeps it up. Keep that attitude up, man. We like that. Us fantasy guys like that when you want to keep the ball at the goal line. Oh, absolutely. 100%. And again, like out of these six guys and everything, I don't think anybody is somebody you pick up and you just immediately start. But every single one of these guys, absolutely somebody you just put on your bench. See, wait one, maybe one, maybe two weeks. See if they keep it up week after week. And then like they could become an every week starter for you. There's no reason why you can't take a shot on any of these guys especially if you're struggling at quarterback in your leagues. So with that, we'll go ahead and move on to running back. We'll try to go through these just a little bit faster. I'm, I I like to talk people's heads off, so that's why me and Xavier always go over time. Uh, so <laughs> we'll go for the first one here. And you can't start anywhere else uh, except for Kenneth Walker this past week. Monster, monster game against Northwestern. I knew the running games in both of these games were going to be, I think, the biggest question marks going into it. I was very curious to see how Kenneth Walker and the rest of the Michigan State running back room would break down. And turns out Kenneth Walker is going to get all the carries over here. And this man ran for over 200 yards and I believe four touchdowns yesterday, 50.4 points. This man's only owned at 28% of your leagues. I would not be surprised in if almost every single league, if Kenneth Walker is the first person off the waiver wire once those process once those claims are processed. Yeah, there's no way that he's under 90% next week. Uh, I'd be shocked if he's unowned at all. I personally can't believe that Xavier talked you out of starting him this week, Jared. Oh, you, you had to bring I, that I up. Believe, you had to bring that up. I can't believe that Xavier told you specifically that there was no way that y'all could start him this week because – uh, he's just not going to get the volume or whatever. He just completely talked you out of starting him this week. It's insane. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, just just a dummy for like even suggesting that. Like, I, I I'm I'm shocked <laughs> that I even allowed that to happen. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm not. Maybe you know what? He, yeah, he loses flex privileges this week. Yeah, he has. <laughs> he has. Uh, he. Uh, um, uh, this is now a dictatorship, and I'm taking over. Uh, for those of you not in on the joke, this is the complete opposite. I was the one that taught Xavier out of starting Kenneth Walker last week, and now I'm in the doghouse. Uh, so, but yeah, like like Justin said, there's no way this guy's under 90% by the time claims are processed here on Tuesday and Wednesday, whatever your league is doing. Um, so if you have that first waiver wire pick, this is the man to go for. There's no, re- there's no reason not to. Go ahead and move on to our second running back here. And this is another guy who just monster monster game Mateo Durant running back at Duke scored 48.2 points this weekend in um their loss to Charlotte he's only owned in 35 percent of leagues this is another one where like I had an inkling throughout the entire offseason where I'm just like I saw him do well last year but like for some reason I'm just not ready to believe in it and once again, I was wrong. This this man is probably the focal point of this Duke offense and even if defenses uh, key in on that. I don't think that's going to be a problem for him week in and week out. What do you think, Justin? Uh, absolutely. The question, the question I had for him all this off season was volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, Duke, Duke doesn't have a long history or really any recent history of running backs getting a lot of volume. And just like we said with Trey Potts earlier, that's what you want, and he's clearly going to get it. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Again. If you miss out on Kenneth Walker, you better put in a waiver wire claim for Mateo Durant because I think either one of those guys is going to be monster for you this week or um, going forward. Third running back we have on the board here. This was some. So this was another player that people are kind of speculating about might have a big year now that uh, Oscar Attaway goes down. But DeAndre Torrey, running back for North Texas, comes out with forty four point one points this past weekend. Has only owned ten percent of leagues. Um, yeah. I did not think that Oscar Attaway going down would solidify Torrey this much as RB1 and just become a massive focal point for that offense during this game. Do you think this is sustainable, Justin? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I was the – in all of my leagues that I was in, I was the last one to hear the news about Attaway going down, (laughs) it appears, because I went in every single league looking specifically for Torrey 
and he was taken in every single league that I was in. And I was kicking myself because I knew that, uh, you know, they like to run all these running backs. And it seems that now Tory is finally the only one that is there. He's the only dude that we know is there. Maybe we can see what his 2019 season should have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and again, it, it, this North Texas offense is an offense that's going to be scoring, and that wide receiver room has become just a, such a muddled mess. Uh, it doesn't really seem like they're settled on who that wide receiver one's going to be. Shorter had himself a really kind of, I don't want to say awful, but like just from what we're expecting, I was surprised that he didn't get more targets. Uh, Tommy Bush was another one I was kind of looking out for. I can't remember the guy who did kind of go off a little bit. Uh, I think it's Bard or something like that. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But again, if Torrey can kind of solidify just his number one role in this offense, he's going to be an absolute steal if you can pick him up on the waiver wire. Uh, next guy will go here. This was something I was praying for at UCF. It, and that was the solidification of the RB1 because UCF has had good running backs in the past. Otis Anderson and Greg McRae have driven me nuts for two years because they'll both have good games, but they'll never have it like in, sequ- in sequence. It's always back and forth between those two. You can never get just one solid running back there. Bentavious Thompson was set to be that maybe this year with Isaiah Bowser and Mark Anthony Richards behind him, but he leaves the team and Isaiah Bowser just came in and I believe he got 32 touches in this game, like between his receiving work and the running back work. Oh my God, give me that all day long. He had 28.1 points, only owned in 6% of leagues. Y'all, this could be special, especially if this UCF offense continues to hum like it did in last week's game. So what do you think, Justin? Yeah, absolutely. The only thing I was worried about is, um, you know, in the Malzahn system, he likes those dudes that he can hand the ball off to a ton. Uh, the only thing I was concerned about in this game is like, is Bowser really the guy, you know, they had him listed as the running back one, but it's kind of just like, is he the guy or is this like last year when it's like, yeah, Shivers is the dude, uh, but Tank Bigsby's pretty good too. We're going to play him uh, in the next few weeks. But uh, I was concerned. It's like, is is Bowser the guy or is Mark Anthony Richards going to take this over in a few weeks? But I, I have no doubt in my mind that Bowser is just going to be that dude absolutely this this whole season they trusted him even when they were down there's no way that they're pulling him now absolutely again just third that the numbers just keep screaming to me 32 touches in that game uh last friday um that that to me just says that there's no there's no reason why he should be at six percent or anywhere close to that by the end of this weekend once waivers are processed uh, next running back I have here, I kind of cheated a little bit here. Um, I do kind of set it at as forty uh, under forty percent, but Charles Williams had just too good of a day for me to kind of ignore the fact that he he is at forty one percent ownership. But Charles Williams is the focal point of that UNLV offense. Granted, they're not going to be playing against um, Eastern Washington every single week in terms of their defense, but even still, uh, I believe it was Mitch Hart coming on to um, the Summa Cum Laude draft with me earlier this off season. Uh, who said that like if you just need a running back that'll guarantee you get get you 15 points every single week and you just don't have to sweat it it's charles williams well maybe charles williams now becoming even more of a focal point of that offense maybe that floor is 15 to 20 points every single week what do you think justin uh absolutely you know we've seen charles williams produce in the past uh it kind of seems like unlv is uh, I think they're anxiously awaiting Tate Martell to see if he can do anything when he gets back mm-hmm. from his hand injury. Uh, and until then, it's uh, what they should be doing is just catching the snap and handing it sideways because Charles Williams is also very is a, also a very good running back that we've seen do good things, kind of fell off a little bit last year uh, mm-hmm. and seems to be back in the form this year. All right, and we'll move on to our last running back here, and that is Mr. Sean Tucker. Well, I'm not sure what's going on with the grab. Oh, wait, here we go. I, I just misplaced it. Let me fix that real quick. Mr. Sean Tucker, uh, running back out of Syracuse, uh, had 24.1 points and is only 20% owned on rosters. So, Justin, what are your thoughts on Mr. Tucker here? Uh, Sean Tucker, to me, is a valuable player so long as Tommy DeVito is the quarterback there. Um, you know, Tommy DeVito is not going to run like Garrett Schrader will, uh, if he doesn't take over this season, next season, um, Sean Tucker is about the only consistent thing about the Syracuse offense. Even last year when they had moments where they were just downright terrible, Sean Tucker was the guy that they leaned on, 
uh, came out this year against Ohio with 181 yards and a touchdown. Not mm-hmm. every ACC opponent they play is going to be Ohio. Some are going to be better. There's likely going to be a few that are worse. But um, Sean Tucker's going to get 20 plus carries, probably top 100 yards with a touchdown every week. If nothing else, uh, you get consistency. And when you're setting a lineup every week, consistency is a good thing to have. Absolutely. All right, so with that, we'll move on to our wide receivers for this week, and we'll go ahead and start with, off with our first one here. That is, uh, I'm listed Mr. Neal. Uh, I'm going to butcher this last name, even though it's a short one, but just Pau. I, I, I think I said that probably terribly wrong. But Neil Pau uh, scored 28.96 points last week. He's only owned on 3% of rosters. I think a lot of this has to deal with the fact that Gunnar Romney goes down during this game. But even still... Uh, BYU was struggling against Arizona for quite a bit. They uh, never could quite put away this game, but regardless of all of that, they were going back to Pau over and over and over again. So, Justin, what are you thinking here? Uh, I mean, Neil Pau and Gunnar Romney were their two top returning receiving targets that you know weren't tied in Isaac Rex. Uh, and so there was a good chance that he was going to get a lot of volume this season anyway, but without Romney – or the Nakua brothers, that's all you got there. So uh, Jaron Hall seems to be relying on him very heavily so long as all those guys are out uh, to the point where if you're a new quarterback and you want that established guy, even when Romney and Nakua and those guys come back, that's the guy that you know you can trust in a game. So uh, I would expect that uh, his status on this team would even retain when Romney and the Nakua brothers step into play, just because he knows that he can trust uh, Pau when things get tough. He knows that he can hang it up and give it to that guy. No, absolutely. 100%. And I was actually kind of shocked by the lack of usage of Isaac Rex. Um, I knew like a new quarterback usually means new favorite targets and everything. That's why that's part of the reason why I wasn't drafting Rex a whole lot this off season. But even so, like once I looked at the points uh, afterwards, I was like, man, they really just did not use Isaac Rex after the monster year that he had last year. That was kind of shocking to me. But Pau looks like the next guy. So we'll go ahead and move on. This is the this is uh, one that kind of caught my eye. And that's Ja'Cory Sullivan, uh, wide receiver at Central Michigan, scored 26.2 points yesterday, only owned on 1% of rosters. I should tell you that I don't think really anybody saw this coming. I think everybody was focused on Khalil Pimpleton, who had himself a all right enough day yesterday. But I think the thing that kind of stands out to most of me here is that Ja'Cory Sullivan is a 6'2 wide receiver, almost 200 pounds. This is not something you tend to find a, a ton of in the MAC, especially going up against those shorter cornerbacks than you typically would in like a power five conference this is absolutely the kind of guy that can take over a game in the mac especially once they get into mac scheduling where you just take the top off a of cornerback and you just throw the ball up hope he gets a 50 50 ball every single time so what are your thoughts here justin uh man so i have a diff i have i'm in like two dynasty leagues and before this year starts, I got me a nice little spreadsheet. And I'm like, these are guys I'm keeping. These are guys I'm dropping because I got to make space. Mm-hmm. And there was moments last year where Ja'Cory Sullivan just didn't do it for me. And so uh, before the season goes, I'm like, I'm going to just go ahead and get rid of Ja'Cory Sullivan. And I wish that I could say that this is the first time that I've done this before the season and was immediately proven wrong. But in 2019, I did the same thing with Art Pierce at Oregon State Mm -hmm. when uh, Jamar Jefferson went down early and then some other dude comes along and swipes him up and then I have to play him and I lose (laughs) and it's probably going to happen this year because someone else is going to pick up Sullivan. And so it looks like he's the favorite target of Jacob Sermon, the Washington transfer, um, especially with Pimpleton doing what he did like four receptions for 38 yards is what I'm reading here. That just is not a whole lot for a guy that do you have any rushing heavily drafted. Uh, he did get one rushing yard on one. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, World of difference. Oh yeah. That point, that point one point probably really helped somebody in their matchup this week. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, yeah, it looks like Sullivan's that guy over there now that looks, looks like they really, trust him over there at central michigan yeah no again i'm I'm absolutely targeting sullivan in almost every league that i have where i even have like a smidge of doubt for any of my wide receivers sullivan is at the top of my list 
for those leagues. So we'll go ahead and move on to our third wide receiver here, and that's Mr. Danny Gray. I was shocked when I looked and I saw Danny Gray was only owned in 24% of leagues. I could have sworn way more people were on this man. Uh, I guess, um, again, I still think Reggie Roberson by the end of the year is likely that number one wide receiver there. I think they're kind of easing him back into it now that you know he's coming off the ACL injury. But even still, until then, Danny Gray absolutely is somebody that should be on almost every league's roster. Uh, man scored 23.9 points yesterday. Like I said, he's only owned on 24%. And until Reggie Roberson gets fully back up to speed, Danny Gray is the number one wide receiver. And we all we saw yesterday, Tanner Mordecai is a very effective passing quarterback for this SMU team. Dare I say he might be better, better than Shane Bouchelle was for them the past two years. So what do you think, Justin? Uh, Danny Gray certainly got a lot to offer. I know uh, two years ago, uh, he was a guy that even when Roberson was at his like greatest heights, was still averaging a touchdown a game. Uh, I know there was some discrepancy this offseason. It's like, who's going to be the other guy? Because the other guy is going to be good too, whether it was Gray or Rasheed Rice. Uh, looks like uh, Gray's talent's just too undeniable, and uh, they're going to continue to ride with Gray in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Again, like, like I said, I was shocked when I saw only 24% because I'm like, I could have sworn more people were on him than this. Uh, so g- take advantage of people being dumb and uh, go snack him up, snatch him up your waiver wire if he's still available. Um, next uh, wide receiver I want to throw out here. This was, I think, one of the bigger question marks of – uh, this past offseason was Jamison Williams at Alabama. A lot of people kind of wondering, like, is he going to be one of those guys that starts full time for Bama this year? Or is he just a placeholder until one of these younger wide receivers comes in and takes over? I think we saw yesterday he's going to get plenty of work in this Bama offense. Uh, very much a deep threat for them. And that's something you want out of the Alabama offense. A guy that can easily just score a 90 yard touchdown on any given play. So he scored 20.6 points yesterday. He's only owned in 35% of leagues. Justin, what are you feeling here? Uh, he looked really, really solid. Um, I, I, I laughed after his long touchdown reception that he had because he ran into the thing out the <laughs> back of the end zone and tripped up over it. That was pretty hilarious. But he, he looked really good uh, out, even outside of the one, the one touchdown reception. Uh, looks like Mechie's one and Williams is two uh, with a guy that's going to be throwing as much as Bryce Young is. It's nice to have either of those guys that are established there. No, absolutely, 100%. The number two Bamba wide receiver is always somebody that you just want to have. If not in your starting wide receiver lineup, great flex option for you that you can just kind of throw in there and be like, all righty, you get that 90-yard touchdown, you're more, than, you're, you're more than good with me this week. Oh, yeah. um, we'll go ahead and move on to our fifth wide receiver here, and that's Mr. Devin Tompkins. Uh, wide receiver out of Utah State scored 20.8 points yesterday, only owned in 6%. I, I said yesterday, but he, uh, on Saturday he scored 20.8 points, only owned in 6% of leagues. This is definitely a name I was hearing quite a bit among a lot of CFF experts. There's a lot of differing opinions over whether or not he was the type of wide receiver that uh, Blake Anderson loved to kind of feed over and over and over again. I think we got a pretty clear answer from this past weekend facing a power five competition like Washington state. And uh, yep. Uh, what do you think, Justin? Uh, if Tompkins didn't pan out, I was going to be in a lot of trouble this year. I've picked up Tompkins. Uh, I think me and Kyle Francis fought more than anybody over who was going to have Devin Tompkins in a couple of different best ball leagues this year. And I am so happy to see that he is what we thought he was going to be. Uh, you know, that dude's going to get a, lot, a whole lot of receptions this whole this season. If, if I don't know. There's going to be a few games where he don't get any yards, but he's going to have a whole lot of receptions. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully they can get a, their guy settled at quarterback. I think they might ride with Bonner from here on out. Uh, but Tompkins is that guy. I hope guy. they do, man. I hope they do. Tompkins is that guy, and they're going to ride with him the whole rest of the season. Doesn't look like there's any sort of competition of being that guy. Absolutely. So we'll move on to our last wide receiver here. And again, this is another guy that you kind of asked me to put onto this list, and I have no problem with that. Uh, but you have Mr. Isaiah Williams, wide receiver out of Illinois, scored 14.1 points this past weekend, owned on only 6% of rosters. What is sticking out about Isaiah Williams to you? Uh, to me, uh, he's just he's an incredible athlete, transitioned to wide receiver in the spring. Um, he, he 
played quarterback in the spring game, and then they announced he was moving to wide receiver, which, you know, you hear that a dude is as talented as he is, is going to be a wide receiver in a Brett Belima offense is not exciting at all. But uh, mm-hmm. over the past two weeks, uh, he caught six balls against Nebraska for 40 yards and a touchdown, and he rushed a couple of times. Uh, this past week against UTSA, he caught eight passes for 100 yards. Didn't get in the end zone, though. Uh, but it seems that no matter what he is doing, whether it is rushing or whether he is catching passes, he's going to get the ball. They're doing what they can to get him the ball. Uh, he might be the best receiving option they have on that team. And so um, if that keeps up when Brandon Peters gets healthy, then that's a positive uh, if not, uh, Sitkowski seems to like him enough to hit him with eight passes a game. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I agree. I, he caught my eye first week. Again, like the, the main name I was looking for for Illinois this year is Luke Ford. He's still one of my favorite players in college football. I'm um, hoping they get him some more work because they didn't really give him much work this past week. I don't know why. Um, but even still, Isaiah Williams is absolutely somebody who's catching my eye. And I agree with you. It looked like you kind of mentioned earlier, consistency is something you love to have on your roster. And it looks like Isaiah Williams will be getting consistent work every single week. And that's something you don't always get at the wide receiver position. So we'll go ahead and move on to our tight ends. We got five tight ends here that we're going to talk to, to talk to. We're not going to talk to them. We're going to talk through them. And we're going to uh, start with the biggest one of the weekend. That's Mr. Payne Durham scored 27.5 points, only owned on 9% of rosters. Uh, if you were a David Bell owner like me, and you're wondering where the hell his points went this past weekend for the most part, even though he, he did all right, but even so, you're, you're wanting like a 30-point game out of him. Uh, look no further than Mr. D- uh, Mr. Durham here. Had an absolutely monster game against Oregon State. Uh, full PPR points. He, I believe, scored on, like over 30 points. Not something you get out of your tight end very often. Uh, this Purdue offense is going to be passing the ball a metric ton load this year. That that didn't make any sense. We're keeping that in, but we're going to pretend like I said something much smarter there. Uh, anyway, Justin, what, do you, what are your thoughts on Mr. Durham here? I like Payne Durham. Uh, I, I picked him up in one dynasty league that I've been in his freshman season uh, when he was under Bryson Hopkins. Last year, he didn't do – he wasn't as much as involved as I would have expected him to have been. Uh, but this season, it looks like they needed a second target, and they found their second target, and it's Payne Durham. And so, uh, and given that he caught two touchdown passes, you best believe that he's going to be a guy that they're looking for in the red zone. It's like, if we can't get it to Bell, we'll get it to Payne, and it'll all work out for everybody that owns him. Absolutely. Milton Wright owners are crying in the corner right now. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to our second tight end. That is Mr. Lucas Kroll out of Pittsburgh. Scored 14.3 points this past weekend. Uh, owned on thir- uh, 3% of r- rosters. Uh, again, this is a name I was hearing a lot before the preseason and everything. Uh, very clearly, uh, one of Kenny Pickett's favorite targets, especially it looks like he gets lesser competition, like UMass, uh, in a, or besides Jordan Addison. So, Justin, what are your thoughts here on Mr. Lucas Kroll? I like Kroll. I, I was looking toward him last season because Mark Whipple coming from UMass to Pitt uh, was a big deal because we all think, oh, we got a talented Florida tight end coming, and this dude just had Adam Brenneman over at UMass. That's a, that's a big deal. And then he seemed like he was non-existent last year. Turns out he was hurt for most of the season. And then he comes out in the spring and has a strong spring. And it's like, okay, if we can translate this to the fall, that'd be really good. Uh, and it seems like Whipple likes Kroll, um, and they certainly need somebody outside of Addison to kind of pick up that slack. They returned a lot of production at Pitt, but – uh, there wasn't a whole lot of like firepower in the production that they return. Like when you think of uh, Taysir Mack and you think of Jacques uh, Shockey Louis, mm-hmm. uh, you're not thinking of dudes who like just blew your mind. You're just thinking of like, yeah, they're, they're, they were pretty serviceable. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jordan Addison's the guy though. But, oh, absolutely. Uh, Kroll looked really good. Um, it, it's, it was very promising to see him play like he did this past week. And I don't expect that to stop. No, absolutely 100 percent we'll go ahead and move on to number three and this was kind of the one again another person i was shocked by their percentage of roster because i know a lot of people who loved grant calcaterra coming into the season this past weekend he scored 18.6 points uh against 
Godly, they played Evelyn Christian. Was it? That? Yeah. Yeah, Evelyn Christian. Uh, he's only owned on 31% of rosters. That is shocking to me. Um, I considered this man a borderline top 12 tight end going into the season. Very easily can finish top 10 if all things are going right for him. And it looks like with the way this SMU offense is being run this year with how pass heavy it is and how much the tight ends are being used. Uh, there's no reason why can't Grant Calcaterra isn't going to have a monster gear this year. Uh, not named here, but the other tight end at SMU, uh, Nolan Matthews, scored 18.5 points. So it looks like that the tight end position at SMU is going to get plenty of work this year. And I have to imagine Grant Calcaterra being the more talented uh, tight end out of the two of those is likely to see a large share of that. What do you think, Justin? Oh, absolutely. We've seen... We've seen SMU run that tight end a lot in the Sonny Dykes era. Um, and Grant Calcaterra going over there had everybody uh, had everybody's jaws dropping at the possibility of it, uh, a player of his skill level going over to SMU. Uh, now that we know that Mordecai is capable of throwing for 300 yards and seven touchdown passes in a game. Godly, that's uh, a- it is. Uh, I- I'm fully on board with, with Calcaterra. Um, if you can get any piece of that offense, whether it be Calcaterra, Roverson, or Gray, you're doing just fine. Uh, and if for some reason Tanner Mordecai is available in your league, absolutely go get him too. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and this is actually something you're going to see a lot with these tight ends and everything, where a lot of pieces out of these high-powered offenses like Purdue, like Bama, like SMU, most of those guys are going to be off like with the wide receivers and everything, but more often than not their tight ends will still be available on the waiver wire and if you can get someone like that that is going to be a piece you're going to want to plug in every single week with that being said look at number four mr cameron latu out of alabama scored 17.8 points this past weekend two touchdowns in his performance only owned on six percent of rosters um a lot of this comes from the fact that jaleel billingsley is in the doghouse with saban and did not play at all this past weekend and if you own Jaleel Billingsley, drop him right now and pick up Cameron Latou. Because uh, I don't think Jaleel Billingsley is getting out of that doghouse, especially after Cameron Latou's performance this past weekend. I see no reason why he should be pulled, even if Jaleel Billingsley does get some snaps. Uh, if I remember correctly, if I, um, credit to um, Dynasty PJ, uh, he put out a tweet about the number of snaps that each receiving option at Bama had on the field. Cameron Latou. Out of the 74 snaps that Bama played, had 50. And it was the highest, I had the highest amount of snaps on the field for Bama this past weekend. Clearly, Saban likes Latou a lot, has liked the work that he's put in this past weekend. And I see no reason why you can't go around and pick up Cameron Latou for your, uh, for your teams this week. Justin, what do you think? Yeah, Latou looked great. Converted quarterback, uh, another converted quarterback popping up. Uh, in this pod. Uh, he looked really, really good. I didn't realize that he had gotten that much of the snap share. That is uh, phenomenal on his part, especially with a guy like Billingsley in the fold. Uh, Saban really does not seem to like Billingsley right now, and he really seems to like Latou if he's playing him that much. So uh, you can grab him. Now would be the time. This is a cheap piece of the Alabama offense that you can easily pick up this week before everybody else does. I would not be surprised if that 6% rises to at least 50, maybe 60% by the end of this weekend. Um, last tight end is just somebody I kind of threw in here, kind of impressed me a little bit. That's Tyreek James, tight end out of Tulane. Uh, scored 12.3 fantasy points this past weekend. Is only owned in 1% of leagues. This mostly comes from the fact that I own Deuce Watts in a league and he didn't get a single catch this past week except for a two-point conversion i'm like all right where if not deuce watts where are these where are these uh receptions going to lo and behold mr tyrick james uh tight end there at two lane getting i believe five six receptions this past weekend um and i believe a touchdown in, in addition to that so i think this is just another name that if you are struggling at tight end in your league and for some reason you just miss out on all the rest of these guys and the waiver wires are processed. I guarantee you Tyreek James is more than likely still there, and he's probably going to be a good piece for you to pick up. Uh, Michael Pratt seemed to like him a lot. So, Justin, what are your thoughts on Mr. Tyreek James? Yeah, eight targets, six receptions, 93 yards. That's pretty solid for a tight end. When I, I, I like you, have a few shares of Deuce Watts myself. Um, and so when I saw that they had hung 35 points on Oklahoma, I was like, oh, snap. Deuce Watts is probably going off. And then you look down the list, it's like, okay, I, I see Fat Watts, but I don't see Deuce Watts. Where is he at? 
Um, and then you see Tyreek James just sitting pretty up there at the top, uh, top of the box score with six receptions, 93 yards. Um, like I said, I don't know if this one's, uh, I don't know if it sustains, but if it does and you take advantage of it now, you're looking really good. The right tight end can, I, I'm not going to say the right tight end is going to carry your team, but the right tight end can win you a league. Oh, absolutely. Um, Kyle Pitts was a monster last year for everybody who owned him. Yeah, Kyle Pitts. Uh, you think back in the past, Jalen Samuels is another mm-hmm. one. You get the right guy on your team to hold that tight end spot where you don't have to worry about it. It's amazing the difference that it makes. Um, it's like picking a kicker that has to boot 60-yard field goals multiple times a game. It's like <laughs> – and it, like if you're in one of those leagues that rewards distance, it's it, like having that guy on your team. It's like, you know, I'm down 15 points and all I have is my tight end to play. I bet he gets it. Mm-hmm. And that's not something you can say with every tight end. But if you get the right guy in the right place, it certainly can pan out for you. Like oh, I'm you sure get- a lot of people, I'm sure the one percent of people won their games this week because they picked up Tyreek James and managed to play him and got 12 mm-hmm. points. I guarantee you a lot of people won their weeks this week because they played Payne Durham for some reason uh, over a lot of the other top guys that people were expecting. Um, oh, absolutely. But those are all our, like, those are those main white wave wire winners. There's plenty more out there. We just try to keep it to about five, six every single week to focus on. Um, even still, you're going to see some more guys that get through the waivers for some reason. This is the main reason why. With, I mean, really with any fantasy sport, but specifically with college fantasy, there's so many guys out there. Just keep researching as much as you can. Try to find guys that go under the radar. See if you can pick them up when nobody's looking. Um, so with all that being said, those are all the guys that really impressed us, the people that we think should be on your fantasy teams. Uh, we're not going to go into people we should drop quite yet because it's only the first week of the season. There's not like a ton of people that were like, oh yeah, drop them now. But I will go through a quick list of people that definitely disappointed for me this past weekend. Uh, first and foremost, Preston Hutchinson. That that entire QB situation in Eastern Michigan is something that I will be avoiding the rest of the year. I'm definitely dropping him for right now until he can take that quarterback room back. I'll take my chances on the waiver wire. Uh, Austin Jones, running back out of Stanford. Just a pitiful performance by Stanford overall, really, in that game. And I think Austin Jones was not the center of it, but definitely he was affected by just how poor Stanford was playing in that game. Eric Gray, uh, I'm not dropping him yet by any means because I believe in the talent, but also he just had a very poor game against uh, Tulane. For some reason, they just were not trotting him out. They were trotting Kennedy Brooks out. Um, I hate to say this, but my boy, Demontre Tuggle, uh, kind of disappointed me this past weekend. I thought that a team as bad as Syracuse, he'd be able to just put up some work against them just wasn't meant to be um i say ty chandler and sam Howell here but really in general i'm just gonna say the unc offense because my god that was a terribly called game um like i'm not i'm not like an, an offensive coordinator aficionado or anything like that but even i was looking at that and saying why with less than a minute left to go you have to score a touchdown are you running the ball straight up the middle there was like there, they were just and they, they re- refused to establish a run game earlier in the game. And they just had Sam Howell continue to try to pass it down the field, but clearly the quarterbacks for Virginia Tech. I could go on a rant about that game. Regardless, Sam Howell still had a respectable finish at the end of the day, but Ty Chandler really was kind of the disappointment there for me, mostly because I just don't think he was given the volume that he should have been given. Uh, Jalen Widermeyer, uh, that one hurt me a little bit in a couple of leagues. Uh, only scored thirty three point six points compared to some of the other tight ends this week. That really looks like a chump. Uh, the first real disappointment of the season for a lot of people was Mr. Dwayne McBride uh, at UAB. Um, I know a lot of people were expecting him to kind of take over the number one back, but uh, UAB refuses to let go of Jermaine Johnson, and uh, McBride fumbled twice, so it doesn't look like they're going to be going to him really as a uh, three-down back anytime soon. Uh, last two here, uh, Jaden Daniels, quarterback at Arizona State. I think this is just one of those cases where uh, Rashad White and uh, Trey Yonam and some of the other pieces just took over and J- Daniels didn't have to do too much. So I'm not going to knock him too much. And then Ulysses Bentley, clearly it was a Tanner Mordecai show. He was passing it all over the field. There was not really a need to run the ball that much. So Justin, out of these guys or anybody else you want to add in here that was just kind of a disappointment for you this past week? Uh, you hit the nail on the head with uh, Preston Hutchinson for sure. Uh, there's a few leagues that I have him in. 
Uh, you know, for, for most of the offseason, it was like you kind of hit a spot where you could draft Dorian Thompson Robinson or Preston Hutchinson. Mm-hmm. You can get one or the other at that spot. Uh, there were times where I saw Hutchinson go off the board a lot more often than uh, DTR did. And so uh, to have this random quarterback controversy come out of nowhere, uh, it, I, I saw a tweet during the game where someone was like, oh, yeah, those two have been battling it out all camp. I'm like, where, it's where like was neck this? And neck. And it's like, why didn't you tell anybody that this was happening? I wouldn't have played him. It, I, I wouldn't have played I wouldn't have drafted him. At the him. beginning of the game and he was gone. Um, and I think he hit the nail on the head with Dwayne McBride, too. Uh as an owner of uh, of Jermaine Brown in a dynasty league, I'm a little upset because I had planned on dropping Jermaine Brown, and then the depth <laughs> chart gets released, and now I'm like, crap, I can't, because what if he does something good? What if he ends up in the, the place where he's too good to drop, but not good enough to play? He also has, so, a, he has that wide receiver running back designation as well, so I'm playing him at wide receiver when I can. Yeah, and it's just, uh, it's like the, the whole Dwayne McBride situation is so strange because we were like, a, like Dwayne McBride was pretty well a consensus top 20 running back, uh, like a top 20 fantasy back heading into the season. We were all pretty confident uh, that he was going to be the guy and it just did not pan out for him at all. Uh, and, you know, the, the play calling for North Carolina was terrible, especially if you're down two receivers. You're down Corrales, you're down Caffrey Brown. Uh, and if you're not getting any success up the middle, I think I had told you uh, in a group chat when we were talking about uh, the Clemson Georgia game, it's like you've got a 350 pound defensive tackle in your offensive line sucks. Why are you running straight at him? Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing with like, it's a little different because they don't have Jordan Davis up the middle for Virginia Tech. <laughs> but if you're not having any success running up the middle, why don't you run outside? And that's like, what there's that's, a whole. That's when they were getting success. The like that's when they were getting success is when Ty Chandler was running to the outside a bit and everything, or like get some swing passes to him and everything. Like I was again, I was just. I'm not anyone to like call for people's jobs or just really to question coaching in general because I'm not a coach. I've never coached football. I never played football or anything like that. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be the first one to come out here and be like, oh yeah, that was a terribly called game. But that was bad enough to where even I was questioning it. Like it, that 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 to me just kind of told me everything I needed to see out of that. Yeah, sometimes you just get these play calls and it's just like it's like, dude, even I knew that was a bad idea. Why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. So anybody else you want to kind of add to the disappointment list here? Uh, anybody that screwed you over in a league or two? Or uh, I think pretty well Hutchinson was the only one that killed me this week. Uh, Austin Jones not playing up the par kind of sucked uh, as well. You know, Master Teague didn't quite produce at a level that he possibly could in a game where they were running pretty effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, um, it, other than that, and DJU doing as terrible as he did against Georgia, uh, that's, that's true, about but the only guys that I have. I'm, I'm not going to put DJ on, on the disappointment list because, again, I if I had him in a league, this would probably would have been the only week I didn't start him because I just knew, I knew about that O line D line mismatch and I figured yeah. that there was going he was going to underperform this week. I didn't think he would underperform this much. But even it's still, a, I think that was... a comp with him. It's a for anybody out there. I've seen a lot of people like losing their mind over DJU. Mm-hmm. And this is my this is what I'm telling you now. Uh, there was moments where he stared down receivers far too long and got sacked. Mm-hmm. And then there are moments where you're questioning if Tony Elliott is even qualified for play calling <laughs> because the fourth quarter rolls around and they throw one pass over the middle, and mm-hmm. they're like, oh, Georgia's – the announcers are like, it uh, looks like Clemson's devising some plays over the middle because Georgia's blitzing their linebackers. It's like, yeah, stupid. I thought <laughs> of that three quarters ago. <laughs> they're blitzing linebackers, and there's no one up the middle. And so uh, there's just moments where they had these terrible things with play calling. They only designed two – quarterback uh quarterback specific runs for him Mm -hmm. i have a feeling they're going to get all this stuff fixed and if they have some sort of red light on him they'll take it off um but yeah it was a bad game for him 
if you're if you own them, I wouldn't be that concerned. They're gonna yeah, I was about to say all this to say, don't if you own DJ and you drafted him in the first round or second round or something like that, do not panic. I, he's it, this is going to be a Clemson team that's still going to roll through the ACC more than likely with only one loss, maybe if if that. So this is like this is going to be a team that they're going to be putting up plenty of points every single week against weak, weaker competition. He's going to be just fine. Yeah. All right. With all that, I think we've covered everything here. Uh, Justin, I just want to thank you so much for coming in here. Kind of last minute notice. Uh, great discussion with you tonight. Uh, I'll be happy to have you back on anytime. You just want to come on, discuss something, shoot me a text. It's been fantastic. Uh, everybody else, thank you so much for listening. Uh, this was a wild week one. Lots of good upsets, plenty of great games. Uh, college football is back in full for the first time in two years. We got crowds. We got game or we got teams mostly fully healthy. Nobody's missing half their roster because of COVID. I think this is probably going to be one of the best years for college football in a very, very long time. Um, in addition to all of that, y'all, please make sure you are following myself on twitter at cff underscore jared you will make sure you are subscribed to our youtube channel uh, in order to see the show in video format make sure you're following us on apple Podcasts and spotify or wherever else you listen to your podcast uh justin before i before you go um please remind people where they can find you and what kind of stuff you offer uh you can come and find my stuff at uh, cffinsiders.com uh have waiver wire drop today uh, try to get some weekly player rankings out as well. Uh, so you can come to cffinsiders.com. Look at all of that. Have an updated, constantly updated list of depth charts just there to where you can look through them alphabetically. Um, if you don't want to look at any of that, you can follow me on Twitter at Insider CFF. Uh, try to do my best to do like breaking news updates and things like that got a lot of pretty graphics i would say your graphics are incredible um, i do my best um i'm a hard person to please when it comes to making those things so i do what i can Man, maybe um, maybe maybe one day when i have money and i i'm not a poor graduate student i can actually <laughs> afford to have you or pay you and make some gra- pretty prettier graphics for this show outside of what i have here <laughs> um, so that would be wonderful to have one day anything else you wanted to add in there uh the, the one thing i do want to add is just uh with it being uh suicide prevention awareness month uh doing all i can to promote uh the suicide hotline that we have uh nationally as well as things like that uh i and a wrestling twitter page uh at essential wrestling have partnered together uh we've created a little store you can uh go in uh you can buy shirts with like the cff insider logo i've got the king's classic logo uh that i use for a few months as well as my uh suicide prevention awareness month logo on there uh matt at essential wrestling has his stuff on there as well and all the money that we are collecting from that is go- all going to uh Holinsky's hope uh, we're going to donate it. Every stitch of revenue that we get is going to Holinsky's Hope at the end of September. So if you wouldn't mind uh, going on, you can get you a T-shirt and get you a hat. Uh, it's on Redbubble, so you can get stickers, too, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, just help help us out. We just want to do what we can to uh, help those guys at Holinsky's Hope out with what they got going on. Yeah, absolutely. It's it probably as soon as this podcast is over, I'm going to ask for that link to that uh, don't or that donation link from you. I personally have had close family members who have unfortunately passed away due to suicide. Uh, so Justin, all the stuff that you are doing for this is fantastic, and I can tell you as somebody who's been affected by this in the past that it means a lot uh, for people to be pushing this awareness out there, letting people know that it's okay to not be okay, and to just reach out and just find people that will be willing to help you out and get get themselves out of these terrible unfortunate unfortunate thoughts that lead to actions later down the line uh with with ending on that happy note uh, (laughs) i appreciate everybody for tuning in and we will see you guys next time on chasing the natty